Well, good morning, Hillview. At home and abroad, and for those who have started traveling and will travel and haven't traveled and refused to travel, and for those of you who are here, you're wondering right now what I'm talking about, aren't you? There's people going on vacation. There's people who stayed home. It's all good. We're, we're together in some fashion or another. I tried figuring out a Facebook this morning. Ben, it was a disaster. How do I send corny love songs from the 70s to my wife on Facebook? Actually, I don't have to worry about that because I've got Ben who's looking after Facebook for us here at the church. And you put up some great pictures this week, um, not the least of which was young Larry Hubscher delivering uh, goods to the Mustard Seed and Hope Mission. And uh, that, was, that was good to see you on social media, Larry, voluntarily or involuntarily. We should have probably made you sign a waiver, but um, that, was, that was great. That's, there's just been some great things happening this month, and uh, it's just an exciting time, and being Christmas, and just an exciting time to be part of this church, because what are we doing in January, Rick DeLue? You can't remember. Food bank. Food bank. Food bank. Um, that starts in January, does it not? All right. We're going to say more about that. Welcome, Josh. Glad you could make it. That's, uh, we're Baptists, not Mennonites. <laughs> Church starts at 1020. I should be quiet. There's more people coming in. Uh, what are we talking about here? Fourth Sunday of Advent, hey? Um, this is it. Um, Next week, it'll be all over, all done. Boxing Day, Gabriella takes it literally. She takes every decoration we have and sticks it in a box and says, it's over. And um, sadly, it is. It is in my heart. Um, but it doesn't mean we stop worshiping God. Psalm 149. Consider this. Consider it carefully. This is an ancient, ancient song. Sing to the Lord a new song. His praise in the assembly of his faithful people. Let Israel rejoice in their maker. Let the people of Zion be glad in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing and make music to him with timbrel and harp. For the Lord takes delight in his people. He crowns the humble with victory. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father. You have shown us your great and deep love in and through Jesus Christ, your Son and our Savior. And because of your great love for us today, we join with your people throughout many generations and across the entire world and praise the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised today throughout all the earth, from the rising of the sun till its setting, both now and throughout all eternity. May the name of the Lord be praised. Amen. Mike, shall we sing our praises to the Lord? Would you rise as we uh, sing these uh, wonderful hymns of praise? And the first one is uh, 132, Angels We Have Heard on High. Angels we have heard of high, sweetly singing o'er the plains and the mountains in reply echo back their joyous strain.
Shepherds, why this jubilee? Why your joyous strain so long? Say what may the tidings be, which is are your heavenly song.
sun of righteousness, light and life to all he brings, lives with healing in his wings. While he lays his glory by, for that man no more may die, born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second Who is he at yonder star? Again, we find ourselves at the communion table, and again, we take opportunity to explain what it means to participate in the Lord's Supper. This ancient ritual has been practiced by the body of Christ since the death and resurrection of, of Jesus Christ. Communion, Holy Communion, the Lord's Supper are all various titles for this ordinance. An ordinance is a prescribed religious rite. Communion is something we do in obedience to the teaching of Scripture. We observe communion to remember and confess that we have been and need to be ransomed and redeemed. Our sins have been atoned for by the death of Christ upon the cross and the shedding of his blood for us. Hopefully this explanation answers the question, who can participate in the Lord's Supper? This ordinance is for people who have put their faith in Christ. As the Apostle Paul explains to the church in Rome, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord 
will be saved. This table before me is for all who have confessed faith in Christ and desire to honor God through word and deed. This is for the established believer and the prodigal child. This is for the old and the young, for the rich and the poor. This is for the poor in spirit, for those who mourn, the meek, and those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for the merciful and the pure in heart, for the, peace, peace, for the peacemakers and the persecuted. This is for all who long to see the return of the Lord. We come to remember the death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ, and to reorient ourselves to who and what we are in Christ. We come to the table to confess our sin, our need, and our hope. When we partake of the elements, we are confessing not only our faith, we are affirming our unity in Christ, that we are one body. Paul, writing to the church in Ephesus, tells them to, and I quote, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. When we come to this table, we are exhorted to examine ourselves. Paul warns the Corinthian Christians, so then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. So as we prepare to share in the elements, let us examine ourselves to discern if there is anything we must confess to the Lord, anything to repent of, anything to commit, anything to correct, anything to resolve. And as we partake, may we consider carefully the cross, the tomb, and the blessed hope that we have in Christ. We will distribute the elements, and then I will lead you in prayer. At the conclusion of the prayer, we will read the scripture relating to the Lord's Supper, and then partake together. I will step down to the table. Connor, could I actually ask you to pass to people the bread, and I will give them the cup. Um, if you are new or visiting with us, it's our practice to leave out the sides of the church and come down the center aisle and return to our seats um, on, the, on the side wings. So uh, just give me a moment, and uh, Connor, if you would step up, please. And uh, using the tongs, we don't want to touch any of the elements. Again, I believe that there are sealed cups if you wish to take the two-in-one, uh, or else just the cup itself.
Let's pray together. Make this your own prayer. Heavenly Father, I bow before you in humility and ask you to examine my heart today. Show me anything that is not pleasing to you. Reveal any secret pride, any unconfessed sin, any rebellion or unforgiveness that may be hindering my relationship with you. I know that I am your beloved child, having received you into my heart and life, and having accepted your death as penalty for my sinfulness. The price you paid covered me for all time, and my desire is to live for you. Lord Jesus, as I take the bread representing your body that was given for me, I remember and celebrate your faithfulness to me and to all who put their faith in you. Thank you for your extravagant love and unmerited favor. Thank you that your death gave me life, abundant and eternal life. As you instructed your disciples, I too received this bread in remembrance of you. And in the same way as I take this cup representing your blood, I believe that you are the supreme sacrifice for all my sin. Because of your blood shed for me and your body given for me, I am free from the power and penalty of sin. Thank you for defeating death. You took the death that I deserved. You took my punishment. Your pain was indeed my gain. And today I remember and celebrate the precious gift of life you gave me through the blood that you shed. Even though my relationship with you is secure, I know sin affects our fellowship. I'm still human and I often forget who I am and whose I am. Holy Spirit, convict and correct me so that I might live a life worthy of the calling I have received. I am truly grateful that you will never disown me or leave me. Before I take communion today, I'm asking you to truly search my heart and reveal hidden things for which to ask your forgiveness. Lord God, as I take communion today, I commit my life, my heart, my thoughts, my everything to you. Help me to hold this fresh remembrance and the story that never grows old close to my heart. And Lord, help me to share its message faithfully as you give opportunity. Amen. Let us take a moment. The Apostle Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it 
in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Thank you, Lord. Hasten that great and glorious day and find us faithful when you return. Come, Lord Jesus. Come. Amen. Good morning. Did you know that the Bible does not directly or specifically mention Advent for different weeks or even Christmas, celebrating, let alone December 25th, but celebrating the birth of Christ at all. But these are things that we do. They're traditions. And yes, there's biblical support for the intention and the message and the meaning of each of these things, but there's no command to celebrate Christmas. But in Deuteronomy 6, there are are commands Commands that God gave through Moses to the Hebrew people and by extension to us today. In fact, Jesus in uh, Matthew, the end of Matthew, chapter 28, says, go and remember the things that I've told you. In Ephesians, remember the things that I've told you, Paul tells the church at Ephesus. And he's doing that here. God's telling the people, the Hebrew people, to do something specific, a commandment, to remember what he's done for us, and in our case, through Christ, to study, to understand his word, his message, so that when the problems of life come, which they do hourly, each day, we know how to handle it. We know what to do. Whether we do it or not, that's up to you. But you need to know what to do. What do you do? Well, the Word of God tells us what to do, how to live. Now, this is the commandment, the statutes, and the judgments, which the, <laughs> the judgments, which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you, that you might do them. that you might actually do them. Do them in the land where you are going over to possess, so that you and your son and your grandson might fear the Lord your God, to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you, and keep them all the days of your life, that your days may be prolonged. He says what to do, when to do it, and why to do it. O Israel, O Hillview, you should listen and you should be careful to do it in the New American Standard or what a New American Standard version that I'm reading out of. It is, estab- it is what's the word, italicized. You have to be careful to do it. Do the commandment so that it may be well with you. Again, he explains why. So it may be well with you, and you, that you may multiply greatly. Just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you, in a land flowing with milk and honey. Don't we live in a land flowing with milk and honey? Hear, O Israel. Hear, O Edmonton. The Lord your God. With, <clears throat> the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. 
These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit down in your house and when you walk by the way. So when you're inactive and when you're active. And when you lie down and when you rise. He's saying always. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So he's saying at all times we need to be prepared for the challenges that each day brings us, even today. Even with all these wonderful things that we celebrate, there's difficulties and trials that we face. And you're facing them right now. I know I am. Because we're people in a sinful world. And we're being told that it will be well with us, it will prolong us, it will sustain us, it will encourage us, it will give us hope, it gives us reason to understand the message of Christ. Now let's go to our, our prayer time. Not only praising God, but lifting up some concerns and some people, some churches, family, These are of our, what our, our role and responsibility is as a Christian, as a follower and disciple of Christ. Let's pray. Father, we're truly thankful for Christmas, but we're thankful for, for your word. Your word, Jesus Christ, and your word written. It instructs us and teaches us, and Christ gives us examples. You've shown us how to live. You've told us what you expect of us. And not because you want us under your thumb or you're some gigantic boss that wants to rule, but because you love us and you know what's best for us. You know that you want us in perfection in paradise with you for eternity. And that only through Christ is that possible. We don't understand. But increase our faith. Help us, Father, in our unbelief. Help us in our trust. Increase that trust, which is the faith in action that we need to actually do it, to do what you command, and not just speak about it, and not just think about it. And Father, we lift up people who are trying to do that, not just here, but we pray abroad. People like the Westerners, they believe that you've put it on their heart to start a new church. Start a new church in Colorado. I don't know why. But you know why. And we pray for direction and for peace, for understanding, for patience, long-suffering, clarity, not just in their lives, Father, but in the lives of those who love them and support them and those who would come alongside of them. Bless the ministry that you have planned. Open the doors and close the doors that you would receive the glory, Father, in that area. We pray, Father, for the same thing at the church in Creston. I don't know if they have found a minister. I don't know if they are looking still for a pastor. But, Father, whatever they are doing with leadership, we pray, Father, that the right people, the right person that you would bring to them that your will in meeting the needs of that community in that area in southern BC, very southern, would be met. We thank you, Father, for that congregation that seeks to know you and to do what you've asked. And we pray your blessing on them this week, this day, this Christmas season as they move into the new year. Bring them together to serve not just you, but each other in Christian love and the community to see it and know, know who they are by their love and desire to know you better. Father, we pray for the Blakes, all six of them. Each of them have similar needs and each of them have very unique needs and you know them. 
and you love them, and how good it is to be known. To know that no matter what we have in our hearts and in our minds, you love us. And we pray, Father, for each member of that family as they seek to serve not just you, but your community, your family of believers, and to, to, to support each other. We pray for peace and protection on their homes, not just their physical homes, but their bodily homes and the heart, Father, that holds dear to your love in each one this day and throughout the week. Help them to do it as we pray you'd help us to do the same. And Father, we pray for this church, this church that's watching on TV somewhere, some computer, that's here present right now, that we seek to serve you. And if we don't, straighten us, Father. Straighten our road that we would understand we are to serve and to serve gladly, to serve diligently, and to let you work in your time. We pray, Father, for our leadership here, for our volunteers. They need direction. And you're ready to give. And you do give. We praise you that you have given and that you will give. Father, what a wonderful opportunity to stand and sit and praise and think and listen and learn and share in this building that you've provided, in this community. Encourage us, Father, as we learn more about you in this message today. And we praise you, Jesus Christ, that through obedience and love for your Father, you came to earth. You fulfilled what you were asked to do because you love your Father and you love us too. Oh, what an act of obedience. Help us to understand that yes, you loved us, but you showed us obedience to your Father and we must do the same if we want to experience the peace in our hearts that you came for. And it's all of these things and the intricacies of our lives we ask you into our day, Father. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. his face or appearance that would draw others to him. He lives as one without a home, migrating from hill to hill. He is as weathered and hard as the stony hills of Judea on which he tends his flock. His sheep know him. They recognize his face, follow his voice, respond to his touch. In the morning, he leads them out to green pastures. In the heat of the day, he rests them beside still waters. And in the evening, he counts them, calling each one by name, attending to their wounds with oil and comfort. At night, he lies down in the mouth of the sheepfold, his body becoming the door, the only source of protection against the elements and enemies outside. His eyes are keen, able to scan the horizon by day and penetrate the darkness by night. His ears are sharp, alert to the sound of danger and the individual cry of a wandering sheep. His shoulders are strong, bearing the burden of the young and the weak who can no longer bear the journey. It is to him the angels come. It is to him the message is given, and he responds. Through the little town that knows not his name, from house to house he moves, bearing the burden of love, willing to share it with those who will listen. A savior has been born, a shepherd who will give his life for his sheep, a lamb who will give his life for the shepherds. For the child of the stable is the shepherd of love.
Well, good morning, everyone. Our New Testament reading is found on page 990 of our pew Bibles in front of us. And what great love it is. The Word of God from Matthew 22, starting at verse 36. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So far, the reading of God's word. Well, the fourth Sunday of Advent, love. Did some research about love, learned a lot of things about love. Love is a boat. On this boat, love is exciting and new. Some of you have a song going through your head right now. Loves all kinds of things. Uh, I discovered that according to some people, love, uh, love bites. Um, Love bleeds, love stinks, love will tear us apart, but on the bright side, love, love will keep us together. I could go on and on, but you know, it's, it's something, hey, 1984, the rock band Foreigner, they asked that epic question, what is love? I want to know what love is. I want you to tell me. And so I went to a vast array of scholarly sources and asked the question on Facebook, what is love, an adjective or a verb? And it won't surprise you that very quickly somebody said, a noun, a noun. I hadn't even considered that it could be a noun. And so uh, so I looked into that. Love is a noun. A noun, if I remember back to my grade school days, is a person, place, or thing. So did you know that love is a place? It's a town in Saskatchewan, about 30 miles northeast of Prince Albert. Population, 50. Um, But real place, even has a tourism center where they advertise their their pies. It's a last name, Davis Love III. It's it's a name. It's, um, It's a person. According to Pat Benatar, it's a battlefield. According to Tina Turner, it's a second-hand emotion. According to the Beatles, love is all you need. Um, Is it a place? Biblically, probably not a place. But it's definitely a person. God is love. And it is a thing. Because the most common definition of love is that it is an emotion. It is an intense feeling. Um, Looking at psychology today, I read on their blog that um, love, love is one of the most profound emotions known to human beings. While need for human connection appears to be innate, the ability to form healthy, loving relationships is learned. I think that's kind of fascinating. We understand and use the word love probably most in this context, in the context of an emotion. We use it to describe how we feel about someone or something, which would make it an adjective, but it could possibly be an adverb. If you consider love as an adjective or an adverb, something that describes a feeling, yeah, you know, what I just mentioned. It's, it's a source of pain. It's a source of, of grief sometimes. It, it's a source of cynicism, but it's, it evokes feelings within us, doesn't it? Willie Nelson once said, most of us aren't with our first love, which is what keeps the jukebox going round. Um, I don't know about that, but, but it's remarkable how many songs have been sung about love and about broken hearts and 
and all this stuff, right? Um, I mean, I'm sure this was not your experience, but there are one or two occasions where as a teenager, I sat in front of our Lloyd's Hi-Fi stereo dual eight track tape player, built in tuner and turntable and spun my KTEL records and listened to sappy love songs because the love of my life went back to her hometown after the summer was over. Ah, should have been there the summer I discovered Don't Stop Believing. I believed Susan would come back next year. Where did she go? Or that other girl in grade 11 who broke my heart. Three days, three days I sat there and listened to these songs. It's a feeling, it is. That probably wasn't love, but, but it is a feeling. Undeniable. It gets tricky though. Because, and, and I was actually serious, like if you saw my Facebook stuff, like I was actually being serious. If you're using an adjective to describe an adjective, does the adjective you're describing become a noun? Or does it remain an adjective? Can, a, can an adjective describe an adjective? I don't know. Um, but you know what's, what's really fascinating about, about the word itself, about the word love, is that it is most properly, or if you, if you actually, if you're a grammar geek, you will know that in actuality, its primary function in our language is as a verb. See, one of the tricky things about, about love as an adjective is we can describe what love is. Um, and if a foreigner would have just phoned me, I would have told them. I would have quoted scripture. Love is patient and it's kind. It does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. You know, this is probably the NIV and you don't want to take it too literally, Gabriella. Um, it's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. We can describe it, but when you get right down to the bones of it, what is love? And love is a verb. Love is something we do. If you just think about the word itself, and just even the way we use it, even when we want to use it as an adjective, I love ice cream. Love it. I do. I even love vanilla ice cream. Briars with the extra, is it Briars or Byers? doesn't matter. I never read the label. All I'm looking for is the real ice cream bit because you can get those frozen desserts which are just nasty. Love it all. But do I actually love ice cream? Would I die for ice cream? Most days not. But think about that. I love. You love. He, she, even our dog. It loves, right? Arguably. Our dogs love us, don't they? We love, you love, they love. We can parse this. It's a verb. We can speak about it in the past tense. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. We can talk about love in the present tense. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to them, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. And we know that there's the future tense. Love never ends. Love continues. We have love in the future. But you know, this really, this morning, it wasn't supposed to be a grammar lesson on the word love. But I want to consider it just from a biblical theological perspective. And Rod, I think you, you really nailed the hit, on, the hit on the head. The head, you, you got it right. <laughs> and love is, first and foremost, love is a command. The Shema, which was located in the center of the passage that Rod was reading, Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5, gets reiterated in Mark and in Matthew, Connor read the Matthew passage. Mark 12, 29 to 31 puts it like this. Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, 
Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like it. And you should know that that is not prioritized. It is actually linked. This is the first side of the coin, and here is the second. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment, singular, greater than these. It's the summation of the Torah. It is the relationship between loving and obeying. In 1 John 5 and verse 2, the scriptures say, And among Jesus' final words, he establishes the divine expectation. In John 15 and verse 12, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Which means that love is not only a command, but if it's a command, it's also a choice. The practical implication of any command is that it's volitional. And by that I mean it's done or made or given with one's own free will. In other words, we can refuse. We can rebel. We can say, nope, I'm not going to do that. And this really flies in the face of people like Woody Allen. You might remember this from some 20 years ago when he was exposed as being in an inappropriate relationship with Mia Farrow's adopted daughter. He, was, he entered into a relationship, a romantic relationship with his stepdaughter, and allegations went back to the fact that the relationship started when she was probably 15 years old. And Woody Allen defends his actions by quoting the poet Emily Dickinson, The heart wants what the heart wants. I have no control over what I feel. I have no control over what I do. My heart is this incredible force that compels me to behave, even if it's against my will even if it's against my reason, even if it's against my morals. The heart wants what the heart wants. What a bunch of nonsense. What a bunch of nonsense. What do the scriptures tell us about the heart? Yeah, the heart is deceitful and wicked. Hey, the heart is easily led astray. I mean... Don't we all love our children? Do we let them get away with everything and anything? If you were raised in the 70s, if you were a child born in the 60s, you probably remember getting a few wappity wap waps across the behind, unless you were some angelic little child, but let's be honest, hey? I kept those comic books around because they came in handy when the wrath of mom came, came visiting. You could stuff those comic books down the seat of your pants and she could hit you all day with that hairbrush and it just didn't matter. Until one day in my utter foolishness, I laughed out loud and pointed out that it didn't hurt. And she figured out very quickly why it didn't hurt. And she removed all barriers to my greater education. Of course, we don't do that anymore because we all know that's wrong. But... Uh, I don't know. Discipline is part of love. Sometimes love means making the hard choice. Love is sacrifice. Love is putting others above yourself sometimes. Isn't that what Jesus did? Didn't he leave his throne above and come and slum with us, get down into the muck and the mire and enter into a sin-filled, sin-riddled world? to show us a better way, to show us the way out, to lead us out of this forest of iniquity, to lead us to that proverbial promised land. Isn't that what he did? Love is a choice. It's something we're commanded to do. It's not this force that just controls us, but something that we engage in with our heads as much as our hearts. It's not simply an emotional force, but it's actually a, a cognitive, volitional action. It's a command. I mean, you want to talk about one of the most obscure and upsetting and confusing portions of Scripture. Let me read it to you right now. 
You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Or in other versions, holy as your heavenly Father is holy. And isn't this exactly what Jesus did? Isn't this precisely what happened as Jesus hung upon that cross and he said things like, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Did he not live this out? When he was being led to the cross, did he utter curses upon them? Did he invoke the armies of of heaven and, and call angels down by multitude and legion to destroy his persecutors? But because he loved us, he endured the scorn and the suffering, the shame of the cross, so that by his stripes we might be healed. No greater love has a man for another, but that he lay down his life for him. I don't know if I ever want that tested around here. I don't know if I would die for you. Connor, it's been nice knowing you. It's like, pray for you. Who knows, maybe I might step up to the plate. But we know this about love. It is something that we are commanded to do. And even though it's a choice, it's not really a choice. If you're a Christian, you got to love. Because you know what the third thing that love is? is Love is a character trait. God is love. And if you, if you look at the syntax, the Greek grammar there, what is actually happening isn't that the scriptures are saying that God is loving. It quite literally says, God is love. Which means that whatever love is, it's defined by God. Whatever God is, that's what love is. That love doesn't qualify God. God qualifies love. So if you want to know what love is, look to God. Get to know God. Understand the character and the attributes and the actions, the historical narrative. Figure out who God is, past, present, future, eternal, infinite, and all being. Figure out who God is and you will know what love is. Because it's a lot more than an emotion. It's a lot more than a town in Saskatchewan. It's something that we're called to do. It's something we're called to be. It's, it's, it's a command which makes it a choice, but it's also a character trait. It should be the brand on our hide. That when people look at us, they see love and they can recognize that because we love, we belong to Christ. Last week, we talked about joy being a fruit of the Spirit. Well, the very first thing listed there is actually love. Love is a fruit of the Spirit, which means that love can be cultivated. And both the Holy Spirit and spiritual gifts are described as gifts from God. You know, it's always kind of kind of, I don't know, it's kind of the thing this time of year to say, oh, Jesus is God's gift to us. But I did a little bit of a Bible study this week, and you know that nowhere does the Bible describe Jesus as God's gift to us? I mean, if we're talking about all the things that Christmas isn't. (laughs) You had me scared there. I thought, did he become a Jehovah Witness? It's like, (laughs) no! Thank you for redeeming that moment, Rod. Um, Bible doesn't say Trinity either. I'll tell you, Jehovah Witnesses can mess with you if they come to the door because they can show you things that are true but kind of, sort of, not really and half-baked in so many ways. But where was I going with all that? Oh, yeah, Jesus. Never described as God's gift to us. Do you want to know the things that, that are described as God's gift to us? Grace, Christ's righteousness, the Holy Spirit, spiritual gifts. There's a couple others. But never Jesus. Never Jesus. Jesus came to bring us gifts. 
But Jesus himself wasn't the gift. I think that's fascinating. Love is a character trait. God is love. It's the fruit of the Spirit, which means that if we're Christians, we will be loving people. And love is what defines someone as a Christian. You can love and not be Christian, but you cannot be a Christian and not love. Should we do a little Sunday school test, Jeremy? And they'll know we are Christians by our... I am so glad that none of you said, by our attendance, <laughs> by our degrees, by our activity at the homeless mission, which are all acts of love. But they'll know us by our love. So you show me somebody who says that they're a Christian and they do not love, and I'll show you somebody who's not a Christian. Because, because there's a lot of confusion still in our world today that, you know, somehow if I get up early enough and I can drive my way to the church and I can enter in through the doors and I plunk myself in the, the pews, well, well, that just makes me a Christian. Nope. Nope, it doesn't. A Christian is someone who believes certain things. And to believe something means that it compels the change in your nature and change in your behavior. We watched a program last night, hey? And um, part of the plot was, it was a police show, but it was a pretty disturbing show. Um, the plot was this guy beat up his wife routinely. And... Um, his son, trying to stop the beating, hit him on the head with a vase and uh, was going to go to jail. And this guy's been beating up his wife for years. <laughs> he says to her in the hospital room, because he got a pretty good knock on the noggin, says to his wife, you know I love you, but not as much as, you know, I, I love you more than you love me, obviously, and you need to work harder at loving me. <laughs> you beat up your wife, man. You don't love her. You do not love her. And how do we know that he doesn't love her? Because he hurts her. You don't hurt, you don't intentionally hurt people you love. You know, it's just amazing to me how we get so many things confused in our world. You know, I love Jesus as long as Jesus keeps showing up and ponying up, and providing, and blessing. And... But if I endure suffering, if I endure hardship, I'm out of here. If I don't get answers to my prayers, I'm done. I don't think you ever really understood Jesus. I don't think you ever really understood what, what exactly God did for you. And you know, this is always the really compelling thing, isn't it? If Christ loved me so much that he would endure the cross and go through everything he went through, and he tells me to love other people in kind, how can I refuse? How can I refuse? And love, loving people doesn't mean that you become their doormat. It doesn't mean that you become sort of, some sort of slave or servant. Love is so much bigger than that, and so much more encompassing than that. You know, it's always such a tricky thing, isn't it? Like, like I'm so glad you're around to, to do counseling, because, you know, counseling is a tricky thing, hey? And uh, premarital counseling, premarital counseling, I'm going to try to farm out as much of that to you as I can. But, you know, you sit with these, these couples, and inevitably you get, you get the old... Uh, Ephesians 5 stuff, you know, you make sure she knows that she should submit. Eh, okay. Um, read the whole thing. You're supposed to love her the way Christ loved the church, right? You're supposed to be willing to sacrifice even your entire life for her. Are you willing to do that? Are you ready to do that? If Gabriella said to me, Norm, it is in my heart and I'm just going to go with an old theme here. 
it is in my heart to move to Calgary, I would say, Gabriella, I don't love you anymore. <laughs> no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that. I would say, why do you think that? We would talk about it. But if it was really on her heart to move to Calgary, if I really loved her, then doesn't it compel me to sacrifice everything I want for her? Doesn't it? But you know where so many guys want to go so often? I make the decisions around here, and I say we're doing this, and you'll listen to me, and you'll submit to my... It's like, wow, did you ever miss the boat? What a corrupt understanding of the gospel do you hold? Do you understand the level and the depth to which you're supposed to love your wife? And you know, I heard Gary Small Smalley say this once. He said, I have never met a wife who has a problem with submitting to a husband who is committed to loving her as Christ loved the church. And put that in your pipe and smoke it, fellas. How committed are you to loving your wife? And to the end, or to that end, and this is always a hard one, to love your neighbor as yourself. Because this whole idea of loving God and loving your neighbor, they're actually connected. I can't hate my neighbor and say that I love God. That dog just don't hunt. That just doesn't work in any way, shape, or form. And so it means sometimes that we make sacrifices. When we seek the betterment of others, when we lay down our pride, our, our rights for someone else. You know, where this, where this got absolutely, absolutely exposed in the church, and some of you might not love me after this, but... And I appreciate the fact that some people can't wear masks, but honestly, just the attitude towards it. I don't like wearing masks. Can I even use stronger language than that? I hate wearing masks. Look at the size of me. Try to imagine the size of my lungs. Try to imagine how much air I need to suck in on every breath to oxygenate enough blood to go rotating through my body. It's lots. You can see that when I wear a mask. It's like a scene out of the Flintstones artist. I don't know if you ever remember that when Barney and Fred are camping together and Fred's snoring and Barney gets blown out of the tent and sucked back into the tent and blown out of the tent and sucked back into the tent. When I breathe, you see that in my mask. Glommed on my face. Out from my face like a parachute. Back on my face. When I sing, it's even worse. And then it's all damp and moist. It's like I'm singing in Panama. It's disgusting. It's gross. But, out of love for you, I'm going to suck it up. I'm going to strap that thing on. I might pull it away from my face so I don't hurl. But, you know, like... Out of love for you, I'll wear it. I will sacrifice what I want for your good. And isn't that what it's all about? Now I have the attention span of a gerbil, so sometimes I forget things, but if you see me not wearing a mask, it's not some militant statement against masks. We're supposed to love each other. And that's probably the most tangible, immediate example I can think of. But even for you to come here today, in the world of the Omicron virus, shouldn't we do everything we can to keep each other safe? Use the hand sanitizer. It's free. We won't charge you for it. Mind you, if we got a nickel, <laughs> never mind. Should be a quarter. What can we do to love? Love is a fantastically unique thing. It's a noun, it's a verb, it's an adjective, it's all of those things. But ultimately, love is something that we choose to do. We're commanded to do, but we choose to do because God loves us. We have control over it. It's volitional. It's not some esoteric force that controls us. And probably the most convicting thing about it all is the understanding that love defines our place in the kingdom of God. 
So if I could teleport back to 1984 and hear that question get portrayed on the radio, I want to know what love is, I'd write them a letter and say, you know what, love is God. And love is active and sacrificial and compelling and total. But love is rooted in God. And while we love in certain ways, the only way we can love perfectly is in and through Christ, whose love perfects us and will, in all reality, come to full fruition in that great and glorious day when Christ returns and makes all things new. Let me pray for you. And pray for me, Father, because at times I am not loving. At times my humanity and my sin get the better of me, and I am not loving at all. Forgive me, Lord, and impress upon me the value and the gift that is love. And help me to love as you loved. Lord, um, I fall short. So Lord, help me. Help me to love as you loved. And help me to reflect Christ to all I encounter. For truly, Lord, would be my heart's cry to pray and speak and declare, as Simon Peter did, Lord, you know I love you. Amen. Michael, would you come and close us this morning? to sing the last uh, song, the silent night, holy night.
Beautiful song. We're going to sing it again in a few days, aren't we, Ben? When are we doing that, Benjamin? Friday night. Friday night. What time is it getting started? 6 p.m. here at the church. We, uh, we just had the pews done, a massive investment. Um, and so after long discussion at the uh, worship committee level, we decided to invest in some electric candles. I know if you're a purist, you might say, that's an electric candle, what's that all about? Is that like, what's that? Mm. And you know what that's all about? It's about preserving our $85,000 investment. That's what that's all about. Because apparently operating a candle is beyond too many people. It's still going to be a candlelight service. Everybody relax. We're have candles. It's just going to be a little different this year. And we're going to sing Silent Night. You won't be here, will you, Mike? Will you? Will you, Mike? You won't be here. Will you be here? Will you be here, son? Will you be here Friday? You won't be here Friday. You have a party at your house on Friday. That's what you don't want to admit to. I'm telling you, these Ukrainian people. Man, we got invited once to that 12 meatless dishes. Oh, that was good, wasn't it? I'd skip Christmas Eve for that, too. But they never invite us, so I don't know. I should shut up now, right? Back to the Bible. Let me bless you with these words from Scripture. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with you all. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above the heavenly Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Oh, may God bless you all as you go forth in his name and his way and live your lives for his glory. Some of, you, some of you are going away. Some of you, some of you guys all are going away for Christmas. God bless you. Drive safely. Have a great time. Merry Christmas to you. Some of you have other plans and are going to be staying home. God bless you. The merriest Christmas to all of you. For those of you who are coming Friday night, we'll see you then. And may God's richest blessings go with you wherever you travel today and throughout this week. We are dismissed. Thanks for coming. Please leave.